A lot of folks dropping into the room tonight. So um, I received my five last week, Janet. That's awesome. Thank you for ordering five. You contributed to a very exciting milestone that we'll share here in a second. Great, so I'm gonna stop the screen share. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Keep saying hi, keep saying where you're calling in from um, and I'll talk slow so we have a chance to get everyone in uh, the Zoom room tonight. But welcome everyone to Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. My name is Claire Haley. I'm our Vice President of Democracy Initiatives and Author Programs at the History Center. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome all of you here in the Zoom room tonight to this talk and to welcome tonight's very, very special guest, Cardia Brown. So Cardia just released her very first cookbook last week. It's incredible. It's called The Way Home. And it includes over 100 recipes. I think she said 125 total. Um, what, uh, describing her roots in the Sea Islands, Gullah Geechee culture, and Southern culture. And it is an instant New York Times bestseller just announced this week. So thank you all to those of you who have already purchased your book uh, for supporting Cardia on that milestone. If you're not in that club yet, don't worry. You can help her out with week two. Um, I'm posting a link to purchase that book from Atlanta History Center's museum shop. Not only will you be supporting Cardia's run at a week two on the New York Times bestseller list, but you'll also be supporting programming here at Atlanta History Center. During the talk tonight, feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A. I know there will be many of them, so we will do our best to get to as many as possible. I'm going to briefly introduce tonight's author, though I don't think she needs all that much introduction given all the enthusiasm we've seen in the chat. Um, but Cardia Brown is a contemporary Southern cook born in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, she's of Gullah Geechee descent, a term used to describe a distinct group of African Americans living in that coastal region of South Carolina and Georgia who have preserved much of their West African culture, language, and cuisine. She created the new po the pop-up New Gullah Supper Club, which actually soft launched in Atlanta uh, back in 2015, which is great. And she's been all over Food Network. She has a, her own show, Food Network's Delicious Miss Brown, has appeared on a variety of other shows, and now, of course, is a published cookbook author. Cardia, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I appreciate it. I am just so excited to be here. And um, Atlanta is my second home. And so it was a no brainer to do a, a stop here, even though it's virtually. But yeah, Atlanta's definitely on the list. Well, thank you. We're so glad that you're here tonight. Again, even if it is virtually, um, we are so thankful you made the time and your really busy schedule. So first off, stating the obvious, congratulations on the cookbook. It is beautiful. It is chock full of just incredible stories and recipes. Um, you detailed that it was a long and winding and not always super direct uh, journey to get there. But take us all the back, all the way back to the beginning. Where did your love of cooking start? That would have to be in my my grandmother's and my my mother's kitchen. Uh, they uh, are just natural cooks. I, I come from a, a long line of of cooks in my family, and I always saw my mother and my grandmother preparing meals with love and the smells and the sounds and the rhythms in the kitchen. Just, I instantly fell in love with food, and then. Also, I think I was just like naturally born a foodie. So um, that's where my, my love started. And you, you detail in the book, you have this really wonderful introduction in the book where you take us through, you know, your journey to becoming to the cookbook and to becoming uh, the, the uh, professional that you are today in the realm of cooking. But can you tell us about the very first dish that you made all by yourself? Because you talk a little bit about how um, while you were always in the kitchen with your older relatives, they would kind of tell you, you know, it's okay, you can just sit back, And but you did a lot of observing. So what was that first uh, dish you did by yourself? So that was macaroni and cheese. Um, I was at my, I have a, um, a half sister, her name is Evita, she's been on the show a few times, and um, I was at her house with her siblings and her mother, and um, we're all just like hanging out, I was like, oh, it's Sunday. Let's, let's cook dinner. And everyone's like, well, we'll, we'll take a part. You'll, you'll get this dish. You'll take that dish. And I said, Cartier, what, what are you cooking? And I said, 
And I didn't want to say that I've never cooked in the kitchen by myself. And so I said, I'll make the mac and cheese. <laughs> and everyone's like, okay. And all the while I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm freaking out because I've never made macaroni and cheese. I know how it looks. I know I kind of have the gist of it, um, but I just didn't know what I was doing. So I called my grandmother and my grandma, they're allowing me to make macaroni and cheese. And she's like, who let you in their kitchen? I said, Arlene did, and she's okay. So just, just how, how can I, how, do, how can I make this? And how can I like knock their socks off? So she gave me her ingredients, the, the directions and um, long story short, that same day I made it and everyone loved it. And then you were hooked, right? On that oh, feeling. absolutely. That was the start. You couldn't keep me out of the kitchen after that. Yeah. How old were you? Just out of curiosity. I was 14, mm-hmm. you know, and it just, and growing up in a Southern household, it was one of those things, especially like growing up in a Southern African-American household, kids are just not allowed in the kitchen. You like <laughs> my grandmother says, you know, you ain't, in her Geechee accent, no mucksing up in her kitchen. Mixing <laughs> up. So, uh, you know, we were all, I was always allowed to watch and view and kind of ask questions, but just, uh, uh, it just wasn't a place for kids um, in, in our family. So um, I had the know-how, but it was just being able to physically get in that kitchen was what I was longing for. Mm -hmm. Well, you didn't go straight into the culinary field, you know, after graduating high school and all of that, you took a pretty hard detour from anything related to that. Um, you decided to become a social worker, which is an incredibly, an incredibly important, but incredibly stressful and difficult job. Can you talk a little bit about what drove you to that profession and then how eventually you found yourself um, pivoting away from it a bit too. Um, so I've always loved working with um, children and I've always loved children in general. And so I knew from a very young age that I wanted to do something with children. I didn't know if I wanted to be a teacher. I didn't know if I wanted to work in social services, but something in my heart said, you know, do, do community uh, outreach social services. So when I graduated from high school, um, I, I went to Oglethorpe University here, you know, in Atlanta. And um, I uh, decided to go there and, and pursue my undergrad in psychology and a minor in um, sociology. But I knew from that point on when I, I did a, a work study program at uh, Boys and Girls Club in Brookhaven that I wanted to um, pursue my career in in, in um uh, children's services or children uh, for children uh, advocating or advocation. And so um, after that, I said, okay, I'm going to go do this. I graduated from Oglethorpe University and I got into my first, one of my first jobs was at Georgia Mentor. And um, I worked as a, um, a child wear welfare manager. And I said, okay, I'm going to do this. But I, I just didn't know how much uh, and how taxing being in the child welfare services was and in, in working in child placement services. So um, while it was my heart to work in, you know, social services and community services, I just didn't know how much it was going to require of me mentally and physically. And so being, uh, you know, 20, 21, 22 and working in this, this field was hard. But that, that's, you know, that my, my mind was, this is what I was going to do. I was going to do that, eventually open up my own nonprofit organization. And in my mind, save the world. Uh, but I didn't know that saving the world would eventually involve food. More than one way to save the world for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so to get from your journey as a social worker and in the child services field, back to cooking, you unfortunately did go through some really difficult times. Do you mind to the extent that you're comfortable, do you mind sharing a little bit about your struggle with mental health and how that um, brought you home in some ways and brought you into this field? Yes. So um, again, you know, working in social, uh, social services and child welfare services was very difficult. Um, there was times where I was working with um, children that were deemed very difficult to place. And so when, once they were in their placements, they had either, um, you know, um, behavioral issues or mental health issues. And so there would be times where it'd be three o'clock in the morning and I'm on call and I'm getting this phone call 
that either a child has run away, he has physically harmed someone or himself. And, um, you know, having to deal with that again at a very young age and wasn't, I wasn't necessarily prepared for that in schooling. You know, you can learn all the textbook things, but nothing can ever re prepare you more than the real, uh, the real world. And so um, working in that field just took a lot on me. It took a toll on me to the point where I was so stressed out that I began to have pains in my neck, in the back of my head. I started having um, these tension headaches that just would not go away. And um, it also got to the point where I, I couldn't swallow food. Um, you know, my anxiety and my um, just my anxiousness was so bad. Uh, and I got to the point where I called my mom and said, you know, I can't work anymore. I can't because I, I, I can't do my everyday thing. I can't, I can't even take care of my everyday needs. And so my mom said, you know what, just take a leave of absence from work or a mental health absence or a mental health leave and let's figure out what's going on. So I went to several doctors, all of them just prescribed medicine, nothing really, no one really knew what was going on because there was nothing they could see on the MRIs. There was nothing they could see on the CAT scans and all of that. And so they said, okay, you may just have generalized anxiety. And which I, I, I'm pretty sure I did, uh, but there was something much more that was going on. And, and I didn't find that out until later on. So as you're working through through that those difficulties, you also talk a lot in the book about how central your faith was to helping you really turn that corner and get on a path that was going to, you know, best serve you and best serve your community and everyone in the future. Do you mind talking a little bit about the role of your, your faith, your personal faith and your success? For sure. I, I'm without a doubt, faith is what got me through. Um, I had faith that everything was going to eventually work itself out, even though that was one of the darkest times in my life. I just knew that if I, I, I kept that mustard seed, a mustard seed of faith that everything was going to eventually turn itself around. And it did. Um, but there was times when I just, I didn't necessarily want to commit suicide, but the thoughts came in my mind frequently that, you know, if I'm not here, then I don't have to deal with this. Um, and so I, I got myself out of that dark time and I wouldn't say I did it by myself. My, um, I have a, a aunt that, really kind of helped me uh, get into the spiritual path. I grew up very uh, religious per se. And um, she helped me kind of hone in on spirituality and having a, a closer relationship with faith and, my, and God. Um, and I started to read and I started to have, uh, I started to meditate and meditation and yoga. I, I, I swear by it to this day has helped me in such a way. And it helped me get out of that dark space. Um, and my aunt also said, you need to be still. I think the universe or God is telling you to be still there. There's something you need to learn in this moment, in this time, in the season. And you can't do that unless you just, you're, you're still to hear it. And so one day I said, okay, I'm going to go walking in the park, which I did normally. And I, that time I sat down at, on a bench near near the water and I just didn't do anything I didn't think I didn't say anything and I heard move and I'm like uh God, where am I going I have no I'm, I'm on leave of absence I'm getting like 80 percent of my check like I can't where am I going um but eventually it came to me and I decided to move to New Jersey uh to pursue my uh, grad school degree and how was, how was New Jersey? I know you joke in the book that New Jersey isn't necessarily everyone's idea of where you get called to necessarily, yeah. but for you, yes. it really launched you into a whole new trajectory. Tell us about New Jersey. What was going on up there? So I had one cousin that I knew that lived in Bloomfield, New Jersey, and I called her and I said, you know, I got to get away from here. Uh, you know, at the time I was living in Atlanta because I was right out of college. So I said, I got to get away from here. I need to go somewhere. And she said, just come to Jersey. I'm like, okay, um, it's all I know is you. And I had some friends in New York, but I didn't have any friends or anyone outside of her in New, in New Jersey. And so I, once I got there, I, it wasn't too long to where I found a job at Big Brothers Big Sisters and I started working there. But in that transition, I was it's just, I wouldn't say miraculously, I think it was <laughs> destined to the way it happened, but the pains and the feelings and all of the things that I was going through kind of slowly but surely started to diminish. 
I didn't have the headaches. I didn't have the stress. I didn't have the stress or tension in my shoulders. And eventually it just went away. And so I, I started working big, at Big Brothers Big Sisters as a um, as a mentor supervisor or match supervisor. And it was one of the most beautiful things ever because I was no longer in child placing. I was just supervising um, mentors and their littles is what we called them. And it was just a really positive thing. And I met so many different people from different walks of life. And, um, and then that's where I started dating someone that (laughs) I guess, uh, is kind of responsible for, very responsible, um, for my um, big break with television. Yeah, I love this story. So I want to hear you tell it, but just first off, like A plus uh, to that person that you're dating. (laughs) But I love that it's, you know, I'm going to let you tell it, but it's not just that they filmed it, right? It was just your pure joy from being in the kitchen that catapulted you into that, that really just... I don't know, serendipitous, I guess, moment. So tell, tell everyone who hasn't had the book yet, though, how, what, what went down? How did you get um, on the radar of TV folks? So I'm at the time living in Bayonne, New Jersey, a very small community. And I'm, you know, I always loved cooking for other people and I loved cooking for him. And I, you know, would always, yeah, I'm a character. I have a lot of personality. <laughs> I, you know, um, my current uh, spouse likes to call me extra. And so <laughs> I'm, um, you know, I was, uh, I was cooking and I'm talking and, and he, I look and I turn my, my back and I see that he was recording me. And I said, what, what, what is this for? And he's like, oh, I'm just going to put it on the Instagram. I think you should start like blogging and maybe doing a YouTube or whatever. Cause you know, you are really funny in the kitchen and you can burn, you know, you can cook. And so I'm like, okay, whatever. And I'm just talking to him and he's recording and I'm cooking. And after that, I didn't think anything else of it. I'm like, I didn't think, you know, is it on Instagram? I didn't see it again. And a week or two later, I get a call from um, Pasquale um, DeFazio and Jenny Kirsten. And they're like, we're calling with follow productions. And we uh, got a video from your boyfriend and he said that you're an excellent cook and we love your personality and we want to see um, if you're okay with us coming out to film you for a new cooking channel show. And I'm, I remember the exact day because I was in the mall with my mom and I go, because she was visiting me at the time. And I'm like, you're, you guys are joking. I don't, I don't know if you have the wrong number, um, but that, no, <laughs> I've never been on TV before. Oh my gosh. They're like, no, we're real. This is real. Um, and we would love to come out and film you for three days with, uh, with Bobby Dean, uh, for a new show called the Dean of lean where, uh, Bobby uh, came in and took these Southern rich, um, foods and turned it into leaner, uh, more healthier versions of, of the dish. And so he came out to Bayonne. They came out maybe a week later from that call. And on the last day of filming, the, the executive producer, um, Pat DeFazio walks up to me and says, you know, you are a natural. Are you sure you've never been on television before? I've never. I think the closest thing I've ever done was a, was a stage play at Oglethorpe. And, <laughs> and I don't think I did well at that. Um, so he's like, I think you got something here. I think you should consider doing some food television. You're, you're, you're awesome. You're a natural. And that's something that I heard a lot throughout the course of those days of filming. It's like, you're a natural. You're a natural. And I'm like, I don't, you know, while they were filming, I didn't see the cameras. I didn't feel like they were there. I was just being myself. Um, And I guess being myself kind of (laughs) worked. I just love that story. You know, how sometimes, you know, things just fall into place. Now you you specify the book, it doesn't go, you know, it's not like you got that pilot and then you were straight into food network stardom. There was, (laughs) there was a lot more to that story. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I'd love to dig into it a little bit, but for everyone in the audience, we are going to start talking um, what I'm sure a lot of you are interested to hear um, about some recipes here in a second. So I'm actually, while Cardia is, uh, Cartier, excuse me, is talking, (laughs) I'm going to launch a poll because we want to know what type of recipes you're most interested in hearing about so we know who we have in the audience and we kind of know what to focus on. 
Um, but okay, so you have this, this pilot, it doesn't get picked up. Ultimately, it happens a lot in TV for, for those who don't know, unfortunately, but you know, it really helps. I, I, from what you say in the book, it seems like it helps you realize, okay, this is actually something that, you know, could sustain me and could be mm-hmm. you know, financially too. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk about um, your supper club? and how you arrived at that idea and about your first soft launch of the supper club, which I'm fairly certain was in Atlanta, which is just yes. awesome. <clears throat> yes. So, you know, like you said, uh, fame and stardom do not start as, uh, you know, quick as um, I thought that it was originally going to happen. And so I, um, the, after that, that three day filming, um, I, my producers at the time said, okay, you know what, we are going to um, pitch you to the network because we really think you're cool. And so I did, I did a sizzle reel, which is like a two minute video of me, my background, I'm talking to camera. There's like inserts and all of that. It's a really cool video. Um, We shop it to Food Network. I go to two meetings at Food Network. The first one um, was the one that I, that I decided, you know, this is going to, this is going to be it. Um, But it was in April of 2015 and I, I just knew that this was going to be my big break. I go into Food Network with my, um, with the two producers, the owner and the producer of the of the uh, production company, and I bring them okra soup. And there's this long conference table, and there's all these executives from Food Network, and I'm like, okay, they're going to love me. I'm going to get my own show just instantly. And uh, if the overall um, tone of the meeting was, we love you, but we believe you're not ready yet. You're too green. You, 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 you're, you're still working at Big Brothers Big Sisters. And we are just not sure that you can hold your own show right now because you have not worked in the culinary world. And how can people uh, see you as, a, in a, as an authoritative figure in the food world if you are still working in social services? So figure out your path. And maybe, you know, we can revisit this. Um, but the overall uh, tone, again, was that I was just not ready. And so I did not take that as a no forever. I just, I, I looked at it as no, not right now. And so I um, left that meeting. Um, I got on the Newark, uh, I went to Newark Penn Station where I'd always been going. And I got on the train and I said, you know what? If I want to take this serious, I have to take myself serious. I'm going to quit my job. And um, I didn't talk to anyone about it except my um, boyfriend at the time. And I wrote a resignation letter and said that I'm going to be, my last day would be on April, I believe it was like April 30th of 2015. And I'm going to figure this out. So I quit my job, (laughs) I resigned, and I sold all of my furniture and most of my belongings. And I moved back down south. And on the way back down south, I was on the Amtrak train because I had sold everything that I could possibly think of. And I could only afford a train ticket, got the train ticket, sat there. And it's like, oh my gosh, I just quit my job. I have, I'm unemployed again. <laughs> it's like, you know, I worked so hard to get this life back after having this mental health crisis. I worked so hard to get it back, but then I just sold everything and I have nothing now, um, but a little bit of savings. What do I do? How do I make myself, um, how do I make myself, an authoritative figure in the food world. I knew that I couldn't be a waitress because I'm way too clumsy. And, <laughs> and, I, and I knew I didn't have enough um, experience to be a chef uh, immediately in a restaurant. So I said, okay, how about catering? I'm like, I don't know if I want to do catering. There's so many people that do catering. But I thought about this, uh, this uh, concept called Feastly. And I was like, if if Feastly can be a thing and people can open up their apartments and homes to, to random people and make dinner and make money, then why can't I do something like that? And I said, I thought about it like, mm, you don't have your own apartment. <laughs> You're moving back in with your grandmother and your mom. Like you, you, you can't, you can't do that. And so I thought, you know, why not do a traveling supper club where I bring Gullah food because that's different. No one, you know, you, you kind of basically have to come to the Low Country to experience Gullah food. Why not bring that to the world? Why not, t- you know, pack up my belongings, get everything together, and 
create a supper club based on the food that I grew up eating. And that's how I kind of gave birth to the New Gullah Supper Club on an Amtrak train on my way back down south to Charleston. So <laughs> um, I created the New Gullah Supper Club, didn't have any money. So I had to go do a GoFundMe uh, to get up some money to buy some pots and pans. And I had family members that believed in my vision that purchased things for me as well. I was able to get a car um, with the money. And so I decided to to do it. And Atlanta was my first stop. It was a soft lunch because my mother lives in Atlanta and I have a, a huge family and following in Atlanta. I decided to do a soft launch where I just gave out samples of the food that I would be potentially making on the supper club at, at the supper club. And it was a hit. <laughs> I was like, Oh, you guys really love my food. They loved it. And so, um, from there on, it was history. I, it got to the point where I went from begging people to try my food to a waiting list. Uh, and, um, yeah, that's where my culinary start started in at the New Gullah Supper Club. That's amazing. I just, I love that it was on an Amtrak train that you just yes. dreamed up this wonderful new idea. And um, in the poll, we did have a, a tie, but one of them, so it's a great launching point off of this, uh, that folks want to hear about is your Gullah go-tos, like those recipes that you grew up eating that are so inherent in your culture that you just really wanted to share with the world through this cookbook. So can you talk, first of all, a little bit about what Gullah food is and what it yes. isn't and, you know, where it shows up around Southern cuisine. Cause mm -hmm. um, if y'all aren't familiar, you know, as I go through this cookbook, it's like a lot of what I consider to be, you know, staple Southern is, comes from, you know, this tradition. Uh, so you can you talk about a little bit about Gullah food and then what your uh, go-tos are from this cookbook? Yes. So Gullah food is, um, the Gullah people are direct descendants of West African enslaved people. Um, so uh, West African enslaved people, that includes um, Sierra Leone, Liberia, um, Ghana, um, some, somewhere, uh, some uh, tribes from the Ivory Coast as well. And so during the transatlantic slave trade, um, they were brought over uh, to the low country area, the marshlands of the South, uh, to cultivate the grain rice because the area was just so um, ideal to cultivate the grain rice. And so uh, settlers knew that the people of West Africa had this vast knowledge of, of, of the agriculture of, of, of um, rice, the crop rice. And so, of course, against their will, they were brought over to the low country and um, sold to rice plantations um, across the uh, Southeast. And so um, because of their isolation on these islands, uh, within the Sea Island Corridor, that's like um, Sullivan's Island, Wadmala Island, where my family's from, Edisto Island, um, John's Island, James Island, um, you know, Defusky Island. Um, all of that down there um, is where most West African enslaved people lived. Um, but at some point the land became so um, infested with disease and, and the settlers were not able to uh, basically live in those type of conditions, but because West African people had lived in these type of conditions in West Africa, they grew immune to some of the diseases that grew rampant in that area. So um, they were left there to live once the, either the, uh, their slave owners died or moved away. The, the West African people were able to, uh, Gullah people were able to live there. Um, and also uh, a lot of people don't know this because I say Gullah Geechee interchangeably, so Gullah is the culture, Geechee are the people. And so um, that kind of, because there were so many different West African tribes that all spoke different dialects and different languages, they had to find one common language to speak to one another and also to, to communicate with their slave masters. That's, that's what gave birth to, to Geechee um, or even Gullah uh, uh, language. And so the food is a direct reflection of the food that they prepared in West Africa. Like we make red rice, uh, which is a form of jollof rice, uh, but in, in West Africa, jollof rice is a little bit more spicy. And uh, Gullah cuisine, it's a sweeter. We add, like to add a little sugar in there, some smoked sausage. We add, um, uh, you know, the mirepoir of, of celery, bell pepper, onions, garlic, all of those fragrant, uh, fragrant ingredients, and um, which is one of my favorites too. But that is, uh, I guess, to answer that question, red rice is one of the 
the number one go-tos in Gullah um, cuisine. And also um, anything with rice, because again, the West African enslaved people were brought over to cultivate rice. So rice was uh, basically the main dish. And because like, I, I like to tell people, my grandmother grew up in the house with 13, 14 other siblings. And exactly, they grew up poor on Waltmala Island. So in order to feed a family of that size, a lot of the dishes had to be one pot and it had to be accompanied by rice because they only had one meal a day. They didn't, couldn't afford to eat multiple meals. And also they were working. Um, most of the day in the fields or on the farm um, or out in um, the creek catching shrimp or crabs. And so um, a lot of the dishes are going to in involve rice. And so you'll look into the New Gullah section, you're like, oh, this is a lot of rice. That's Gullah food. That's Geechee food. Um, so yeah, any of the rice dishes, red rice, crab rice, um, okra stew, that's another one that's very similar to West African food as well. Um, it's made with okra, tomato. You can add um, any uh, protein you like, or you can just keep it uh, vegan. Mm -hmm. And do you have any advice for folks on how to prepare the perfect rice? Because as you say, it's in so many of your recipes. Yes. And so there's a, uh, I have the recipe in the book that it can helps explain how to, to make the perfect pot of rice. Um, because it is so, it's, it's found so often in the book. But the key to that is to rinse your rice. You got to get that starch off the rice. Um, because if you don't, it's just going to, usually when you leave the starch on the rice, it's just going to turn really gummy. And so you got to rinse. I mean, rinse until the water turns clear. And once that water is clear, you cook it with just, I, I like to give an example. So you, if you use a cup of rice for one cup of rice to use two cups of water. And so you want to make sure that that water is just above where you're like the first indent in your finger is. Um, and this is like how my, my grandmother taught me and, I, and it doesn't, it hasn't steered me wrong since, uh, but you put just enough water to cover that rice um, and you let it cook. You don't bother it, steam it and let it do its job. You fluff, Put the lid back on and you should have the perfect pot of rice. And the other category folks are really interested in are weeknight meals. I think we're all, you know, getting back into the swing of things, yes. maybe getting more busy in the evenings. Um, what are your personal go-tos when you just have probably like right now, a really, really busy schedule and not yes. necessarily all the time that you want to have in the kitchen? Yes. And I, I think of that as like maybe meal prepping on a Sunday for meals throughout the week. My curry uh, chicken pot pie. Oh my gosh. So easy to make. You get your store-bought pie dough, frozen peas and carrots, cook it up with some chicken, some curry powder, and you got yourself a meal. My mom's cheesy uh, meatloaf is another fun weeknight meal that I think anyone would love. And then the fun thing about that is, which my mom would always do, would make, she would make the meatloaf, we'll have the meatloaf and veggies or, or mashed potatoes for one night. And then the next day, you take that same slice of meatloaf and you make a sandwich out of it or a sandwich is what my mom calls it. Um, and so those are a fun weeknights. My Aunt Anne's chicken salad is another fun um, weeknight, you can eat, I mean, I, I like eating chicken salad at sandwich as a, as a, as a weeknight meal, but, um, gosh, I could go on and on about <laughs> my low country spatchcock chicken is another one. Um, grandma's, uh, peas, uh, string beans with potatoes and smoked meat, all of those. Mm. Well, I'm hungry now, so thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you for this great suggestion. Um, so when you're when you're cooking and you're tasting your dishes, and there's just something, just a little not quite right about what you're doing, what are your kind of go to methods for making the meal come together? Like, do you have any go to seasonings that you make sure that you add more to, or what What are your tips for us home cooks in this audience about how to just you know add that little something to take it over the top? Sure. That's my house seasoning. That's one of the first recipes in this book because I use it on everything. Um, I started to notice, and I, and I actually talked about this the other day um, at my Philly stop, um, because my, my producer, uh, he noticed after like the first season that, hey, you use a lot of the same seasoning um, in, in your recipes. And I'm like, because those are my go-tos. I know this is what enhances anything that I cook. 
So how about we turn this into a house seasoning or like a, a, a an all-purpose seasoning because you use it so much. And I thought about it, I was like, I do, I do. I should keep this like on the side of my, my stove because I reach for it so much. It gave birth to the house seasoning. And so I, I strongly believe and advocate for the house seasoning. You cannot go wrong. It goes with poultry. It goes with red meat. It goes with uh, vegetables, even seafood. I love that. And I'm going to start uh, getting some of these audience questions in here because there are some really good ones. And if you've had a chance to scroll through, you're getting so much love um, in the in the comments and in the questions. So lots of huge fans here. Uh, Melody awesome. asks, uh, what is your must have holiday dish that you make every year? Oh gosh, that would that have to be my macaroni and cheese, uh, and and I both both versions of it, the seafood and the standard southern um, baked version. Oh my gosh, you can't go wrong with a good casserole dish of macaroni and cheese. That's one of them. I have a few of them, but macaroni and cheese is my go-to. And so, besides the seafood, obviously being in one and not the other, what are the other differences between them? Is there any other difference in the preparation that you do? Yes. So the cheese in my uh, Southern, my standard Southern macaroni and cheese, is just extra sharp cheddar cheese. So just keep it simple. That's the way grandma taught me. That's what we do in that one. Now my seafood macaroni and cheese has Gruyere. It has all of these fancy cheeses. It has sherry. It has um, uh, shallots. It's, it's a little elevated, um, but it's absolutely delicious. And of course it has shrimp and crab meat. That's great. And both sound equally delicious, uh, just in every, in different ways. Um, so another question that's going to be a little unfair, I think, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, Nicole okay. is curious what your favorite dish is to make. And I imagine this is a really tough one to choose, but your favorite <laughs> one to actually make, not necessarily your mm. favorite one to eat. Oh gosh. Um, that would have to be, I have, I have two that kind of, it's, it's a tie my shrimp and grits mm -hmm. and I love making hop and john hop and john is oh my gosh it's not only for you know for for some african-american households it's only made on new year's eve or new year's day for me it's made if I could I make, I'd make it every week um, um those are two of my my all-time favorite dishes to to eat and make so we have a couple questions here from folks who are interested in, you know, obviously they want to try to make your food out of your cookbook, but curious if there's ever an opportunity to actually get to eat some of your food cooked by you. So I'm um, kind of combining two questions into one here, but um, Adrienne wants to know if there's any future pop-ups or cooking mm -hmm. classes um, mm -hmm. that might be on the docket. Um, or if one day you might, Alicia wants to know if you might be uh, looking at opening your own restaurant sometime in the future. Um, so it is a dream of mine to open up my own restaurant. Um, you know, the crazy world that we live in right now, it's just been so hard. And I have so many friends that are restaurateurs that I ask constantly, you know, how is it? What should I do? You know, what is the climate of the restaurant industry right now? And, you know, I've, it's uh, been a resounding it's hard, you know, it's very hard to keep employees, you know, this is in full transparency, you know, and so I said, I don't want to just sell my name and create a restaurant that I have no, you know, after it's open, I have no involvement with because it is my name at the end of the day. And I want to make sure that the food is just as good as if I would cook it, you know, personally. Um, so eventually when the climate is, is better in the, in the restaurant world, I will open my own restaurant. But in the interim, I do have some very cool things coming down the pipeline. Um, soon, uh, the world or the country would be able will be able to um, purchase some of my favorite meals from uh, a major retailer. I'm coming out with my own line of uh, frozen uh, meals. Well, that is very exciting. And we will certainly munch on those while we wait, hopefully, yes. for a restaurant in the future. Yeah, tough. Restaurants, I mean, always tough, but particularly mm -hmm. top climate right now. Um, Mandy wants you to know that she made your shrimp and grits virtually with you. Um, yes. She's a little skeptical about the brown sauce, but it was so, it was multiple O's delicious. So. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, a couple other questions about the holidays. I think all of us have just re realized it's November and it's go time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So 
let's see where I've lost the question who said it, but there was a question that's asked um, about tips for prepping large meals for the holidays. So if you have a big mm -hmm. family coming over, what are your, what's your best advice for making sure they all leave full and happy? Okay. I, like I tell everyone, you have to prep, please, please prep. I thought my grandmother was absolutely crazy because she would start her Thanksgiving prep. Like if Thanksgiving is on the last Thursday, she'll start prepping Sunday, the Sunday before. And it makes sense. You know, if you can cut up your veggies and put them um, in a, you know, a, a zip top bag or Ziploc bag or wherever, do as much as you can in advance. So when the day of, of Thanksgiving comes, you're not, you know, tussling around in the kitchen to get things done. Um, if you can uh, brine, whatever you need to do, do it in advance um, so you don't have to worry about it on the day of. Anything that needs to be baked, um, I, like I say, if you wanna make macaroni and cheese, make the macaroni and cheese a day or two ahead. You can put it in your um, the coldest part of your refrigerator and pop it right in the oven right before your guests come. Um, if you don't, if you're intimidated by making a, a large turkey, which I was when I first started, I'm like, oh my gosh, is it cooked? Is it, I hope it doesn't, you know, hope I don't cut into it and just bleeds. <laughs> and so um, I always say, if you're very intimidated by a, a turkey, let's take the backbone out, take the backbone out, spatchcock it, lay it down. It cooks in half the time. And so once your guests arrive, there's turkey already on the table. It's not a whole turkey, but at least there's some turkey meat on the table. So preparation, make anything, you know, I, I wouldn't say shortcuts, but if you can find something and make it a little easier, like spatchcocking the turkey, go ahead and do that. Just make life a little bit more simpler for you. So when your guests do come on Thanksgiving, you can enjoy them too. That's such good advice. I'm definitely writing that down about removing of that part of the turkey. I had never thought of it, but the bird can be very intimidating. So mm -hmm. thank you for, for sharing that. Um, one question from Tanika, she said, uh, in addition to cooking, you're always such a bright light and beautiful spirit. Um, how do you stay encouraged? It means a lot to a lot of us. Oh gosh, thank you. Um, you know, I'm human and I have my days where um, I feel, I, I feel, you know, beat down, defeated. And, but I don't allow that moment to last forever. Uh, what I do is allow myself to feel whatever I need to feel if it's sad, if it's happy, if it's anxious, I feel that for that moment and then I get out of it. And I remember that I'm, you know, extremely blessed and that life could be very different than what it is right now. And that whatever I'm going on, I live in this, we have this huge galaxy and universe that we live in and we are this little portion of it. And so my, my, <laughs> my, whatever trouble that I'm going through, I realize that there's a whole life out here that's way bigger than me and that it keeps, and it keeps moving, we keep rotating. And so whatever you feel, it's, it's, it's good to feel it, but don't stay in it. And that's how I keep myself going. Great perspective. I'm going to read uh, this comment in its entirety because I just think it's very nice. Uh, Shayla said, first of all, I'm so proud and happy for your book being an instant New York Times bestseller. Um, do you feel, her question is, do you feel that this cookbook will shine a much needed light on the history and beauty of the Gullah Geechee Nation? My father's great grandmother came from Beaufort, South Carolina and made her way down to Florida as a freed slave. Our cooking is very similar and this book brings, uh, breathes life into our past and allows me to explore a history that I don't know much about. Thank you so much. Mm. You are my absolute favorite chef. So Oh, so sweet. Thank you. Um, but the question, do you feel that this cookbook will shine a much needed light on the history and beauty and beauty of the Gullah Geechee nation? I hope so. That, that was my mission. When I decided to make a book, I knew that my uh, Gullah Geechee background had to be at the forefront of this, like it is on the show. And so my, my hope is that, um, you know, I'm not the first to do it, but I, I, I am one of the only ones that has this um, huge platform like Food Network and to now be um, an author and a best-selling author. Now I'm like, you know, there's a lot of people that have the, this book in their homes. And so if they, you know, once you turn the pages, the first thing you're going to learn about is the Gullah Geechee people and where I come from and who I am and who these people are. And that, you know, uh, the fabric of American Southern cuisine is directly um, from Gullah Geechee people. 
And so hopefully this book does that. Um, and, and hopefully that, you know, I, I, the reason why it means so much to have a book like this, because long after I'm gone and I'm not able to stay here and, you know, I wish we could live forever, but we don't. And so long after I'm gone, this book will still be here. So it'll, it'll, it'll keep giving. It's the gift that keeps giving, you know? And so after I'm, I'm, you know, I've said my, my do, this book will keep teaching. And as we were chatting before this event, you mentioned that, of course, there are so many more recipes than you were able to fit into one cookbook, which is good news for the rest of us, because that hopefully means that there will be more. Um, But Melody wants to know, how did you decide uh, what recipes um, you, you would share in your cookbook? And she also adds, you're so relatable and you remind me of the great times I spend cooking with my mother and my sister. Thank you. It was hard. <laughs> it was hard because, um, but I, I think, you know, COVID was one of those things that, you know, it was just, it took the world by storm. And um, I was approached up about doing this cookbook in March of 2020, when basically the world shut down. And so I was in a, a place where I was left in kind of like isolation, like many of us were. And so I had no other, <laughs> had nothing else to do, but be with my thoughts and make decisions. And um, that's when I, I spent uh, the, the beginning half of, of our, um, you know, um, quarantine, just deciding what was going to go in this book. I, I don't think I got much sleep because I was just like tussling with the idea of like, what, you know, what should I do this? Should I use that? Should I not use that? Um, and so I do have a team and we work together to, to figure out the ones that are, were my actual because I mean I said everything was my favorite but that I knew it was like my actual favorite so we narrowed it down to 125 but um I have a ton more that didn't make it that's they're still kind of no they're still my favorite so there will there there has to be another book well we will eagerly look out for it a um, couple questions here specifically wanting to to talk shop a little bit so um, Whitney wants to know any tips on your infamous or famous uh, red velvet cake. Oh, oh, red velvet cake. I mean, that's my favorite cake. That's my birthday cake. I, I like to give to myself. And so with that, you oh, you can't skimp on that vinegar. The vinegar is actually like a, a dough conditioner that makes the cake really, really soft. Um, always use full fat cream cheese because you got to have that cream cheese flavor. Um, I know there's a lot of people that don't like red food coloring. I always suggest using um, beet um, powder if you want to use um, a natural food coloring, but also realize that beet powder can, can also be a, lot, a little drying. And so with that, you want to add just a tad bit more um, buttermilk in your, in your mixture if you don't want to use the food coloring, but that vinegar is essential and good quality cocoa. Great tips. And I'll try to see if we have any other food questions specifically. Um, sorry, y'all are asking so many good questions. It's hard to go <laughs> to go through all of them. Okay, Joanne uh, wants to know again with the favorites questions. I feel like it's ask, like asking you to pick your favorite child. But what what is your favorite <laughs> appetizer um, to introduce people to your cooking style? Oh, that would be my devil eggs topped with grilled shrimp. I just served that at, um, I had a Greenville uh, supper club slash book signing, which I feel so bad for because everyone's like, oh, they got to eat. Um, and so there I, I, we served my devil egg with the, um, my deviled eggs with the uh, grilled shrimp on top and everyone loved it. And it's one of my, if not my favorite appetizer to serve um, because, you know, it's a Southern household, you know, you always go to either baby shower or Easter or some type of gathering and there's going to be deviled eggs on the table. And so um, I kind of made it my own way, low country style by adding that grilled shrimp on top. And yes, it's the bomb.com. <laughs> Well, it sounds amazing. And my feelings are a little, a little hurt now. So you'll have to, there's multiple people, by the way, asking when you're coming to Atlanta um, to do a cooking event. So do you have anything on the books? Yes. So um, I, I felt so bad because, you know, Atlanta being my second home, I, I felt so bad that, you know, 
I haven't done a cooking uh, demo or event in Atlanta in a while. And so um, this is, I guess, because, you know, we're, we're, we're all family here. Um, I want to do, we're planning right now a um, in-person um, party slash signing slash um, event uh, right before the right before Christmas. So look out for that. The details will be coming out soon, but um, sometime in December, we're going to be doing an event in, uh, live in Atlanta. So exciting. And if folks want to know about that, it's the best way for them to go to your website or what would you recommend so they can get their tickets? Both. So okay. website and social media, I will post. Um, so keep an eye out, eye out on that. Um, so I will be posting information on that soon. So I'd say my Instagram first, and then the uh, details will be on my website as well. Mm -hmm. So you heard it here first, folks. Uh, keep an eye on the on the Instagram. Well, we're getting close to the end of our time tonight. We have some time uh, for for a few more questions. Uh, so there's a couple of folks that just had questions about again, just with such a busy schedule that you have. You know, how do you stay grounded and stay sane? You know, with this. So mm -hmm. Inez wanted to know um, how do you incorporate your faith into your daily decisions? I pray every day all day long, I'm constantly praying and I'm also constantly in gratitude. Um, I always tell people, if you don't know what to pray or what to say, just say thank you. And I'm constantly saying thank you because I know that, you know, every moment, every second is precious because, you know, while I'm talking, someone else just took their last breath. So I'm, I constantly remind myself of that. Um, and so that's how I stay grounded. I pray and I keep very good energy around me. Um, so I am a firm believer that you are the company that you keep. And so I have some good people, good, kind hearted people around me every day. And for people who in the audience who are either trying to help instill a love of cooking or of culture in their kids or people who are trying to maybe uh, reconnect with that part of themselves, what advice do you have for those folks? I'm sorry. Can you, uh, I don't know why it cut out, but can you repeat that? Oh, no, no, no worries. Um, so some people in the audience are either trying to, you know, figure out how to pass down a love of cooking to their kids and to their grandkids, or are trying to reconnect to maybe that part or that culture that they haven't really been able to before through cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, what mm -hmm. advice do you have for them? Um, I would say involve uh, your, your kids as early as possible. Um, I know I grew up in a house where kids were not allowed to be in the kitchen and to do those things, but I believe that kids should be involved in, in those, in that process. So when it's time for them to be, uh, you know, go off on their own, because they all do at some point that they'll have this knowledge um, because they spent those precious times with you in the kitchen. I'm not saying necessarily have them in the kitchen all day. You know, it's, it's Monday night. You got to get the kids fed, you know, and it's, it's almost time for bed, you know, not those times when you, when you have the real time to get them in there, always involve them. If it just involves prepping or even talking to them about it. Um, and now that, you know, I grew up in a, a family where my great grandmother did not know how to read or write. My grandmother did uh, get a college education. She was the first one out of her immediate family to do so. Um, but she also, because she grew up in a house where recipes were not written, she didn't write her recipes either. And so now that we, um, I, I'm, you know, cooking for a living, I, I believe in writing down your recipes, write them down, you know, and that could be something that you pass along to um, your children or the younger people in, or the younger generations in your family. So write as much as you can down and even, um, you know, little anecdotes to go with the, the recipes. So you'll know, like, you know, I, I'm making shrimp and grits. Why am I making shrimp and grits? And why is it so important in my family? There's a little head note or something that can go along with that recipe. So you'll have those stories too. I love that advice. And just a couple more questions because we are coming to the end of our time, trying to get through all of them, folks. You have a lot of really great questions. So apologies if we don't get to yours. Uh, Monica wanted to know if you have any suggestions for those who are on a weight loss journey, um, who still want to have wholesome, good food and are looking at uh, your cookbook for inspiration. Uh, you know, me and you both are on this journey. <laughs> it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's a constant battle. It's an uphill battle, but um, I would say, you know, portion size are important. And then also, you know, every day doesn't have to have, you don't have to have fried foods or, um, vegetables that are swimming in meats and things of that sort, and also sodium content. Um, I tell people if it, if it says, 
you know, two teaspoons of salt, especially like in savory cooking, if you know you can't, you know, of salt, if you're on a salt-free diet, take the salt out, take the sodium out, and it'll still be just as good, um, but you just, you don't have to have the salt. Um, again, and then also portion sizes, you know, instead of eating in a large 10 inch plate, you know, eat in a smaller sa saucer. You know, I'm not a dietitian, so I can't, you know, give those type of um, advice, but this is what I do for myself. So yeah, portion control. And also if you want to treat yourself to a slice of peach dump cake, do that, you know, just don't do it every day. All very good advice. Um, this anonymous attendee says, hi cousin, I've heard you refer to cooking as one of your love languages and can relate. Uh, who do you most enjoy cooking for and why? <laughs> oh, oh God, like you got a loaded question a little bit. <laughs> I know. Um, so, hey cousin, I, um, I do have someone very special in my life that I love cooking for because he's a, a, a foodie himself and he enjoys cooking and baking. And so it's really fun to share um, life with someone who enjoys food just as much as you do. Um, so I, I enjoy cooking for uh, my spouse. And there's a recipe dedicated in the book to him. And I actually just mentioned it. It's Brian's Peach Dump Cake. Um, he loved it so much. I just knew it had to be <laughs> in um, the book. But when you have someone who um, loves what you cook, and then I also believe in uh, what you cook from your heart and that's how your food, your food tastes like how you feel. So if you're in love and you're loving, you know, you're, you're in a positive space, your food will more than likely come out tasting uh, like that. And so um, I, I'm such in a happy space in life right now. And I, and I am very thankful that I share, um, you know, life with someone that cares about me just as much. And so, you know, that's, that's why I cook. That's why I cook for him and he's my guinea pig. So. That's so wonderful. A um, few folks are asking as they uh, visit, they're planning on visiting Charleston soon. Um, mm -hmm. So they want to know, since unfortunately we cannot yet visit your restaurant, um, what are the other restaurants you would recommend? Oh gosh, Charleston is a foodie capital. Um, if you love food, you'll be in good hands in Charleston. Um, um, my, some of my go-tos, if you want to come to Edisto, Edisto is about an hour away from the city, but it's worth the drive. I have friends at Ella, and it's a restaurant called Ella and Ollie's. It's in the Wyndham Resort um, on Edisto. And I tell you, it's some of the best food you'll ever eat in your life. Um, Chef Brandon is a good friend of, of mine and, and his wife, Kat, and they just run this family run own operated business. And it's some of the best food ever. Um, seafood, if you want some good old Gullah style seafood, I would say Bertha's Kitchen on um, King Street. I uh, love, oh my gosh, Husk is a, a great restaurant. Um, you have my, my friends at, um, oh gosh, why am I drawing? Uh, Gilly's, Gilly Seafood is another Gullah style soul food restaurant. I can go on and on if you want a good burger, which people don't think about Charleston, like I'm gonna go to Charleston get a good burger. Yes, Little Jack's Tavern has the best burgers I think I've ever had in my life. Um, I can go on and on, but those are some of the places to start. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> those are my go-tos. Oh, and for breakfast, uh, uh, grace and grit, a grit and grace counter. Well, I think that'll keep someone busy for a couple trips. Um, yes. but it sounds like a lot of wonderful places, uh, to, to go to, um, an anonymous attendee wants to know how progress is going on your dream home. Okay, so my the house is almost complete. We're at the end, we're at the finish line. Um, I will be closing very soon on the house. Um, and it's absolutely gorgeous. I know I, I said I was going to be uh, giving you guys updates on, on Instagram, but life kind of happened. And so, um, yes, I'll be giving you guys an update soon, but it's the house is coming together. And I just, I hope that everyone loves the new kitchen. It is gorgeous. Um, I'm still near the Ashley River. I'm actually right on the river. And so we still have that beautiful, beautiful picturesque um, view and, and, and landscape and backdrop, but the house is beautiful. <laughs> it's very exciting. I mean, it sounds like you're a little busy with the New York Times bestselling cookbook and there somewhere. <laughs> so 
<laughs> That's so wonderful. Well, everyone who attended tonight, thank you so much. I have one more question. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Like I said, so many good ones. Um, but this question uh, comes from Gina and it's a very good one, but it's okay if you need to take a second to think. But Gina says, uh, your enthusiasm for cooking and sharing with family is beautiful. I look forward to cooking your recipes for my family. Which recipe do you feel will be your legacy? The one that's most associated with being Cardia Brown. Oh, Cardia man. Brown. Oh, gosh. And I, I say it all the time, but I think it would have to be my legacy. Mm. I have two, but it would have to be my, my shrimp and grits. You know, when you think about Charleston, you think about shrimp and grits, but the way that I prepare my shrimp and grits is the, the original Gullah way. Um, and you don't find that recipe. You can't find it really anywhere. Um, and so uh, I, I think that there are so many people that have said, you know, I remember going to Charleston and, and or I have a great grandmother that I never get to I never got to ask her how to make her shrimp and grits. Um, and it's something that I always grew up on, but you can't find a recipe anywhere um, like they they make it on on um, in uh, the Sea Islands. And so I'm one of the, the only ones right now to, to have a recipe that is, you know, tried and true and it's and it's authentically Gullah. And so I think that would have to be my recipe that my legacy would, would um, be for. It's so beautiful. And I absolutely love that. Well, Cartier Brown, thank you so much for giving us some of your very valuable time tonight. It was just a pleasure. The hour absolutely flew by. And I know that all of us here tonight could probably listen to you talk for a whole other hour, but we know that you need to, to get some rest, but Thank you again for being virtually in Atlanta with us tonight. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. And if you haven't yet gotten your copy of the book, you can see I've marked uh, what I'm making this weekend. Um, Cartier Brown's book is The Way Home. It's 125 recipes. It covers breakfast, lunch, dinner, uh, drinks even. There's a drink section in it. So dessert, it's very comprehensive. Um, please get your copy from Atlanta History Center. There's a link to do that in the chat. And uh, we hope to see you all back here again soon. And Cartier, I'm sure a lot of folks in the audience will see you in Atlanta here in a little, few weeks. Absolutely. Thank you all. Bye, cousins. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.